Let's begin. Hey there, scary story fanatics! Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. What's that you hear? Well, I assume that you hear it too, or maybe I'm crazy. But if you want to know where the source of the noise inside your head is coming from, listen up as if you had a choice to tonight's ghastly gore fest that I like to call Under Thumb, a Seed Eater Story. The sky was black and the forest silent, with the exception of an occasional chirping noise. I was feeling around in the void before me, unable to see much of anything except my hand and the dim light of the moon, eking through the thick cover of smoke-gray clouds. I couldn't see a fucking thing, but I could hear that occasional chirping off in the distance, getting ever closer with each forward movement. There was no sound from beneath my feet, no twigs cracking or leaves rustling, only my breath and that incessant chirping sound. The air still, not a breeze or slight gust. There, just beyond the horizon of the canopy, a black shadow jumped between the limbs. Wait, did it jump or did it fly? I really couldn't tell. Scanning the treetop, I saw it. No, it saw me, I think. It's so hard to tell, but it spoke or thought to me. I, I, hey, hey, honey, wake up, Scott. The words of my gentle wife begin to seep through my ears as my eyes slowly lift. Honey, you're having a nightmare. Wake up. My eyes slowly focus upon her beautiful face, my wrists clasped in her hands. What's, what's going on? What? Shh, relax. You were having a nightmare. You were crying, screaming the word no over and over. And honey, you did it again. We really should try and get you some help for these night terrors. I don't want to sleep away from you anymore because you're hitting things in your sleep. Listen, sit up and tell me about what's going on. My wife calmly sat and spoke to me. I... I don't remember. Something about a forest, I think. And something about a bird? Was I lying? Even I was unsure. I knew what to do, however. I'd always known. Right? What? My wife asked. What, what? You said you'd always known. Apparently, I was mumbling out loud and didn't realize... I'm going to go get you some water. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I replied, just a little stressed out about money and Sabrina. Honey, what are you talking about? We're fine with money, and Bree is a great kid. Yeah, I think I'm just a little upset because she's getting older. I replied. Well, she just turned 11, so I don't think you have to worry about anything just yet. But I know what you mean. You're such a good dad. My wife leaned over and gave me a kiss on the cheek and tucked me back into our queen-sized bed before proceeding to the kitchen of our home to grab me a glass of water. I didn't know how water was going to make me feel any better. Really, nothing would make me feel better. Except seeing her again. She was all I could think about. I knew what that sound was. It had waited until she had gone downstairs. I knew. I knew why it was here again. I wanted to stand and look through the window, 
but I knew my wife would return soon. It's okay. I would have another chance tomorrow. Hopefully, it would appear again, imploring me to keep my word. I would. I didn't want to, but at the same time, I couldn't wait to. Then I could be with her, so I thought. Before much longer, my beloved Wendy entered back into our master bedroom, glass of water in hand. Here, Scott, honey, I want you to take this with some water, she said, as she handed me the glass and two blue sleeping aids. I was relieved at this sight, hoping this time I would not be interrupted and able to view the source of that noise. Unfortunately, I slept the rest of the night in blackness. My dreams had left me lonely and longing for more. In the morning, I awoke to my beautiful, now eleven-year-old daughter, Sabrina, bouncing up and down at the end of my bed with her bottom. Excitement was easily recognized when my first morning gaze rested upon her smiling face, framed by long brown wavy hair. Hey, Dad, you said we were going to go up to the cabin today, right? She asked with eager anticipation, attempting to provoke a smile. She knew I'd been spending a lot of time up there recently, and I've been telling her I've been doing some hiking in the area. She immediately showed interest in going. I'm so glad that she did. It certainly made it easier to get her out of the house, away from the presence of modern technology, and into the dense, beautiful forest that surrounded my family's hunting cabin, a quaint little wooden cottage left to me by my parents after they passed away. All right, so I bribed her with material things, and this is what she was most likely anxious about, but it was imperative that I see her again. It was so important to me that it be happy. I looked into her eyes and assured her that we would be going shortly, as soon as I was able to enjoy my morning and prepare for the outing. She gave me the warmest of hugs with a smile, turning back to say, I love you, Daddy, as she strolled back out of my room. I loved her so much. I rose from my bed, still in my red plaid pajamas, and proceeded into the bathroom for my morning ritual and grabbing something extra from the medicine cabinet, hidden behind the men's one-a-day vitamins. Washing my hands and changing into some casual clothing, blue jeans and a gray hoodie, I went downstairs to meet my family for breakfast. Glancing at my wife and daughter, moseying about the kitchen, I felt a sense of love and compassion wash over me. I couldn't. Was it the chirping? No. Well, maybe. It could have been the chirping of some simple morning birds outside, but the result was the same. My heart fluttered in awe and replaced my previous senses of love. I had to. Had no choice. What's wrong with you? My wife asked. What do you mean? I replied, scratching my neck and then itching at my nose. You don't look right. Are you sure you're feeling up to going? She asked. I assured her once again that I was fine. I mean, I was fine. How couldn't I be? Today was the day. I was so happy. I hurriedly rushed through my breakfast. Occasionally, I would stop and stare out of the window, ever so hopeful. After my wife had snapped me back to reality three times, two times, no, wait, three times. It's so hard to remember exactly what happened. It's like everything gets fuzzy and jumbled every time I try. Anyway, she insisted that I should stay home. Something about how I was acting. But I didn't pay it any mind. Besides, Sabrina couldn't wait to go. Everything was perfect. I knew it would be. It had to be. I finished up a bowl of Cheerios with haste and told Sabrina to get herself ready and into the car. Sure, I noticed the puzzled and odd looks coming from my wife, but I just kissed her goodbye for the day as well. Right? Wait, no, first we had a fight or something. That's right, it wasn't a fight. She wanted to come with us. That's it. Or was it? 
Oh yeah, father-daughter time, I think. Whatever it was, I know it ended with a kiss and a hug as I grabbed my keys and walked out the door. I stood on the porch for a moment, placing my old, worn-out sneakers, stained with small spots of reddish-brown in the front. But since they were old and the material was brown itself, only I knew of its existence. Well, I guess a couple of others knew too, but no one was going to say anything, that's for sure. I got into the car and started the engine. The old Corolla had seen its fair share of road travel, but Toyotas are commonly known for their reliability. I could always count on that car. At least, it made one less thing to be concerned with. I sat for a few more minutes, waiting for Sabrina to finally get ready. Even for an 11-year-old, she sure acted grown up when it came to getting ready to go anywhere. I couldn't, I thought to myself, but I must. I can't disappoint her. I loved her, admired her too much for that. Her? Well, he? It? Whatever. Its long hair reminded me of a tribal-like female's anyway. It's not like I wanted to marry it. What was I thinking again? I didn't want to. That's about as far as I got. I. It. Pushing onward, mocking me of my promise, reminding me of its glory. I think I saw it anyway. It could have been the shadow of a bird in the sky, blocking out the sun, but that's not what I saw. I saw it, and I knew. Maybe I didn't need to see it. Maybe it was always with me, inside me, inside my head. No, I did need to see it. I had to take in its majesty and magnificence. A young girl with long brown, curly hair and a round apple face stepped out through the front door of my home. Sabrina was ready, and so was I. We were all ready. Sabrina opened the passenger side door and climbed inside the old blue four-door. All right, let's go, she said with a smile. So, when do I get to pick up my present? She immediately inquired, as anticipated. I already told you, tomorrow we all go to the mall and then you can pick out whatever you want. I didn't notice at the time, due to my excitement, but she had proceeded to inform me that my wife had told her that she might come up with us anyway, in the silver Ford Taurus. Something I should have paid attention to as I backed out of the driveway. But I was just so excited. We pulled into the long, backwoods driveway that led to the cabin. It was more like a forgotten dirt road than a driveway. As we exited the car... I was at first perplexed at my daughter's behavior as she stumbled out of the passenger seat and fell to the ground outside. I walked hurriedly to the other side of the car to investigate when I remembered. I had been so anxious and anticipative of the events that were about to unfold, I had completely blanked out during the drive here. In fact, it had also slipped my mind that when I fueled up for the trip, that I also bought a soda for her and myself, only dosing hers with the ketamine that I had taken from the medicine cabinet earlier. Apparently, the drug had now taken full effect, for as I rounded the corner of my car, I saw my eleven-year-old daughter nearly motionless on the ground, eyes rolled into the back of her head and mumbling indistinguishable gibberish. Oh, how delightful. I thought to myself. I grabbed my easily movable daughter into my arms and carried her into the brown, wooden hunting cabin only mere yards away. The air was thick and the thin layer of dust covering the upholstery and tabletops signaled that nothing had stirred in its interior since I had been gone during the past week. I placed Sabrina on the nearby couch and sat in an armchair beside her, waiting for the dim light of twilight. I sat there for hours, I suppose, just pondering my doings and the means I hoped to achieve. Occasionally, I would marvel that, although life was sure to remain, 
no audible sounds could be heard coming from the space hidden beneath the floor. That's when I knew I had done a magnificent job. Eventually, the sky beyond the window glass on the other side of the dusty wooden room had turned a shade of orangish yellow. The time had come. As I stood up to gather the old faded blue rug from beneath my feet, I turned to gaze upon Sabrina as I noticed her stirring, eyes fluttering open and fingers wiggling. Where am I? What happened, Daddy? She asked as she turned to me. I knew I couldn't leave her there. I didn't give her enough. I had to hurry with the rug, scrambling to get it up from the surface of the floor before she regained the capability of running away. Daddy, what are you doing? What's going on? She asked as I placed the now crumpled rug on the chair in which I had been sitting. The chirping. That relentless yet beautiful chirping. I know! I screamed. I grabbed a hold of Sabrina's wrist and yanked her to her feet. Before she could manage another question, I opened the trap door, revealed by the absence of the carpet, and walked down the rickety wooden stairs located beneath it, my very confused daughter in hand. Upon reaching the bottom, I opened the small door and pushed aside the very thick red curtain material to reveal a dirty, root cellar-like room. Each wall, along with the floor and ceiling, was covered in the same thick red fabric. Sabrina had stopped asking questions at this point. I wanted to believe that that was because she finally understood, but I am sure now that that wasn't the reason. I think it was the young boy, encased in the crate-like animal trap in the center of the room. My daughter's mouth fell silent as the boy began to cry, sobbing for release, asking for explanation, and pleading for his mother. This boy was only nine, and I didn't know his name, only his age, after he had told me. His pleads for release most likely would have worn on me, but I was used to this. Soon, it wouldn't matter. My daughter, however, was not at all used to any of this and violently attempted to try and break free from my grasp. I held a tight grip, however, and she was not able to manage her freedom. I dragged her towards the cage so I could retrieve the boy as well. He was asking me to stop, I think, and let Sabrina go. But that was foolishness. I couldn't do that. Not after all I had done. The notion of this request actually made me snicker a little out loud. The thought of just stopping everything. <laughs> right. As if I could even if I wanted to. Although the sounds were completely drowned out by the thick acoustic curtaining, I knew she was still out there, waiting for me to bring them to her. I opened the boy's cage and immediately knew that I had made a mistake. The frightened child flung himself at me, biting me, kicking me, and doing everything else a nine-year-old could muster. Although his attempts did not faze me in the slightest, it did turn my attention to him and away from my grip on Sabrina. Her tiny hand and wrist slipped from my grasp as I blocked the harmless attacks from the boy whom I was clutching by the hair. I had to leave him there as I ran after Sabrina, free from his cage but still stuck within the sublevel below the cabin. I shut the hatch to the trap door, making sure to latch it. I didn't think Sabrina could get too far. I figured I had more than enough time to still catch her. Still, I ran out of the cottage with haste, anxious to fulfill my pledge. I'm glad I did, because I was wrong. If I had not hurried, she may have been able to escape, spoiling everything. My wife's car was in the driveway. She stood outside the door beside it, holding Sabrina in her arms, stroking her long brown hair, trying to establish what was going on through the ramblings of our terrified daughter. I had to move quickly. Sabrina screamed to her mother to watch out as soon as she had noticed me behind her. Fortunately, I was already close enough to deal a devastating blow to the back of my wife's head with a moderately sized stone that was contained within my palm. My wife fell to the ground with a thud, and I dropped the rock. 
Grabbing a hold of Sabrina was pretty easy now, as she was focused entirely on her unconscious mother, kneeling on the ground, asking her to wake up. I grabbed Sabrina up from the gravel beneath her knees, dragging her kicking and screaming back inside the cabin. One good thing about a hunting cabin is that finding rope is a pretty simple task. I promptly bound my daughter, mouth included. It wouldn't stop. That incessant chirping. I was going as fast as I could. It was starting to get dark now. I had to hurry. I opened the door to the floor, and the small boy popped out spastically like a jack-in-the-box. I did the same to him as my daughter, leaving them both on the couch in the living room while I went back out into the driveway to retrieve my still unconscious wife. I carried her into the cabin with haste and proceeded into the root cellar. I almost tripped going down the old wooden steps as I was trying to rush now. I put her in the center of the room and went back upstairs, again latching the door after closing it shut. This time, I grabbed the carpet bundled in the chair and replaced it to its original position before returning my attention back to the children. Almost there. I brought them out one by one to the old blue Toyota in the driveway. After we were all inside, I started the engine and drove slowly down the path behind the cabin, proceeding ever deeper into the forest beyond. The night was still and the engine quiet. The children were sobbing in the back seat behind their gags, but the silence of the night beckoned for my attention. It seemed like yesterday. The black sky, the moonlight, everything seemed almost exactly as it was ten years prior. I had been walking down this very trail that night, the night I first saw it. I was followed by the sounds of chirping, an odd chirping, almost like the sound of a baby's cry. The deeper in I walked, the more the sounds seemed to grow, and I knew that something was telling me to keep going, that someone or something was waiting for me. I was right. In a small clearing, beyond the tops of the canopy, I saw something moving, a large shadow jumping between the limbs. I shined my flashlight up into its direction and laid eyes upon the most beautiful creature I had ever seen in my life. It had a kind of messy, long black hair or mane on its head like that of a forest child's whose hair had never touched the surface of a brush. It was adult size, but its body shape was like that of an ape, and its face, its beautiful face, seemed like some type of mask or exoskeleton, pieces of bone-like material patched together. Its two eye sockets were uneven in size, and its mouth resembled something similar to an anteater's could not look away. It was absolutely awe-inspiring. As I stared at it, it spoke to me. Not exactly in a conventional sense, but it spoke directly into my head. It asked me for my Sabrina, who was only a year old at the time. I loved it, but I loved her too. I begged and pleaded with it, but as I did, it felt wrong, almost unnatural, like nails being scratched on a chalkboard. I struggled to keep up my pleas, but just when I thought that I would give in to reality, it responded. It told me to bring it a child each year that I were to keep her. However, I had to resign her life to it by the time she turned eleven. At which time, it would show me something a wonderful, something no human has ever dreamed to dream. It assured me. As it left, I felt a longing for it. I missed it. Her. The Seed Eater, as I would later uncover through research. So, this is how it has been for a decade, presenting one child every year in exchange for my beloved daughter 
but now, her time was up. I even brought another child, just in case. Just in case I could bargain with it again. But I knew deep down that that was not going to happen. Still, I had to try. And I had to know. I had to feed it, and I had to know. As I pulled into position, I heard the chirping sound finally stop. I'm not sure if it had been coming from within my mind or outside the vehicle, but I didn't care. I knew it was here. We were finally here. I turned the key off, shutting off the lights, and got out of the car, popping the trunk as I did. I opened up the back driver's side door to grab the sobbing children. I grabbed the boy first and proceeded to the open trunk to grab another length of rope. I walked the boy him taking smaller strides due to the limited movement of his bound ankles, to the center of the small clearing. I forced him to his stomach upon the leafy ground and tied his ankles to his wrists, leaving him hogtied on the forest floor before me. The smell of pine hung thick in the air. I waited in the dead silence, in the pitch black, crickets and the faint thumping noises of my daughter beating on the door of the car with her feet were the only sounds to be heard. No chirping at all. But then I saw it. The shadowy mass in the treetops. I know the boy saw it too, for when it rustled the leaves in the trees, his sobs fell silent. My daughter, however, did not take notice of its presence yet, as her wild thrashing could still be heard. As I stood still, trying to find where the creature sat within the canopy, it spoke to me once again. It told me to bring Sabrina to it. I think I attempted to bargain with it once again, but I can't be sure. I wanted to do what it said. I needed to help it. It would use my daughter to assist in its immortality, thereby making my daughter immortal. I excitedly rushed back to the car, grabbing more rope and my daughter. Sabrina was thrashing in my hands, forcing me to drag her into position, forcing her onto her belly. She soon found herself hogtied as well, beside the whimpering boy. I took a step back, awaiting the inevitable. I heard a rustling in the leaves above me, just before the entity dropped onto the boy only a few feet from myself, with a jolting movement, as almost being lifted by an unheard, unfelt gust of wind, the form leaped back into the trees, prey in its hands. Soon, amidst the rustling and sounds of twigs snapping, the boy's pleads for help and screams of terror could be heard, signaling he had been freed from his gag. As I listened in interest, my daughter could be heard weeping intensely on the ground before me, apparently listening in terror rather than intrigue. I think she knew that she was next. Before long, the forest fell silent yet again. It thanked me for the extra prey, but it still needed Sabrina. After nodding in agreement, I think a tear slipped from my eye. As the beautiful creature fell from the heavens once more, it crouched over top of my shrieking daughter. I tried to plead with it again, tears streaming from both my eyes now, but it meant nothing. It didn't want to stop, and it knew that I really didn't want it to either. As I stood there, seemingly unable to move or speak, it requested of me yet again. I joyfully nodded in agreement as it took my screaming daughter high into the treetops. It would seem as though she was freed from her oral bonds as well, but it wasn't long until the forest went quiet at last. Knowing the deed was done, and what I had to do, I got back into my old blue car after shutting the back door and trunk and proceeded back home. Things needed to be done. 
I filed a missing persons report after two days, as that is how long the police told me to wait. Sure, I was investigated as a potential suspect, but nothing was ever tied to me. It took a long while, but the heat of the investigation finally died out. They even searched the old hunting cabin, but no one ever found the door under the rug. It's been a year since then, and I have returned to the cabin for the weekend. Yeah, I've been here quite a few times since that night, but tonight is different. It's time to try again. Today, as I pulled back the rug and opened the door, and walked into the plush red room, I noticed my wife on the bed in the center, sobbing behind her gag, and struggling at the bonds, holding her to the mattress. I don't know why she's so upset. I've made the little cellar a lot more comfortable for her than I had for the others. It's been so hard to write this with the sounds of her incessant whimpering and that blasted, beautiful chirping in the background. Hopefully, she'll understand somehow. Besides, it doesn't matter to me. Maybe this time, it will tell me. All that matters is that we try for another. It's hungry, and I have to know. I have to feed it. So, if your defense is the birdie in your head made you do it, maybe you can skate by with the insanity plea. Of course, this is all assuming that you get caught in the first place. So, if you're still unapprehended by week's end, make sure to stop in then for another terror treat sure to deliver the insights you desire. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs>